There's like a specified time to do to solve problems. I remember that. It wasn't a lab, it was a different, like a problem. Okay. I think it was a quiz section, I think is what they referred to it as, yeah. Yeah, well, we had a regular class. I think it was like 3.35 o'clock on Friday afternoon. So ready, ready for a, ready to do a ethics and economics real time quiz. Three minutes for problem. No, no. Um, okay, um, I posted the solutions to those uh, problems just uh, this morning. So if you uh, if you go on to some explanation and, and these uh, the ethics questions mostly come out of the model rules um, but there's some scope of, for interpretation uh, sometimes it's just looking up something that's specified directly in the model laws but you might have to make some kind of a, some assumptions about uh, something or, uh, or, or use common sense along with the, what's, what's specifically written there are gray areas, as we talked about last time, and how these are interpreted. And a key point has to do with, um, it's made in, 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 in um, yeah, number five, the professional engineer who took the licensing exam in mechanical engineering. Yeah, okay. So um, you might think, well, no. The license in mechanical engineering, why would you? could not do uh, work or, or sign up a, a document that had electrical in it, but that's not true. And this is where you have some scope, uh, some room for interpretation. You would not be, it would not be ethical for you to take on a job that was uh, mainly electrical or all electrical. I mean, the expectation would be a licensed electrical engineer would do that. But as you know, uh, most real world jobs are not entirely mechanical or entirely electrical. Some are. But a lot involves different disciplines of drawing or design. You might have calculations and things. And I think in mechanical, where this most clearly comes up is in the specification of motors, motors to drive pumps and fans and things like that. That's an electrical, and that, that's a, a, a boundary where electrical engineering really meets with uh, meets up with mechanical. 
And in process mechanical engineering and HVAC, uh, mechanical engineers will often be doing controls. Um, generally speaking, as a chemical engineer, uh, I always thought chemical engineers were, were the main control engineers, but I do know some electrical and some mechanical will do controls as well. But there's a clear division of labor where chemical and uh, me mechanical engineers doing controls, the expectation is you're working with DC. Uh, generally, you're working with direct current. You're working with instrument voltages and currents, which means basically 24 volts and under, and uh, instrument signals are 4 to 20 milliamp signals generally, at the analog signals, and they get uh, di digitized. But generally, our goal as mechanical engineers is to, is to tell the electrical engineer, give me 120 volts. You know, I've got a control panel here. I need to control some valves and some level velocity and some pipes and ducts. I need 120 volts to drive my equipment, and the electrical engineer's responsibility is to give you that 120 volts and design whatever the electrical distribution has to be to make sure you've got 120 or 240 or 480, wherever you need it. But then it's, 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 it's your job, it's our job to connect up that 480. Actually, the electrical engineer will even connect it up. And when you get into the uh, actual skilled trades uh, where, where you have union rules in place, and I, I've only worked under union rules, so I think in Washington State, union rules would, uh, and there's a clear division of labor. You cannot ask a pipe fitter to hook wires onto a, a pump motor. This gets really annoying if you're an engineer because a mechanical, uh, a pipe fitter or an electrician or, uh, you know, they, they have certain things they can do and, and they can't go outside that range of jobs without violating union rules. So you've got these divisions of labor and they're annoying because sometimes you have to, you've got to plug something in. And it's just annoying when the, uh, uh, the mechanical contractor or the mechanical person cannot plug in a pump. You have to call the electrical person, electrician, to do that. Um, but in, in our designs, um, it is acceptable for us to do electrical or chemical or some other area that is peripheral to our main focus, but not the main focus. And uh, that's why the answer here is you can design an electrical and you feel competent. And that's important. Competency is important. And it's a small part of the overall job. And uh, if, if it's something larger than that, then the expectation would be that you have someone working under you or beside you who is licensed and can stamp drawings. They need to be stamped or designs. Now, they mention here that is, uh, engineering is a profession. And uh, part of the definition of a profession, a profession is, is a set of occupations that are self, where the individuals govern themselves. And uh, they are autonomous. They're autonomous, they're self-governing, and they're generally held to an ethical code, or a you know, code of ethics. is something you see with professions, you know, the law profession, the accounting profession, the medical profession, they all have codes. They all govern themselves. They all have thought licensing boards that regulate what their members do. And those licensing boards are, you know, not government people. They're people like us. The Board of Licensure, prof uh, Professional Engineers, they're professional engineers. And so they're our colleagues, but they're in a position. They're appointed by the governor, and they are, uh, they are given the responsibility of making sure that the state law is followed. And uh, in our professional practice. Uh, but how we practice is left to us. We're given the benefit of the doubt. We can do anything we want, really. The assumption is that we are ethical. We've made a commitment to, 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 to the ethical standards of uh, the National Society of Professional Engineers. And uh, the expectation is we're gonna follow that and we're gonna practice ethically. So you always assume ethical practice, and the only time you, you get into problems is if somebody makes a specific allegation that you did something wrong. Now I may say, you know, I'm competent in, in electrical engineering, and I'm doing work, but somebody catches me, or I make a mistake, and the problem really comes up when you make a mistake. Um, and that can even come up in your own field. If you, if you blow a calculation, or you, you do something that causes a damage, or if something falls down, then people start to look and say, hmm, what is Collins's background? 
Is he, was he really competent to be doing that design? You know, it, it didn't work, it blew up. And that's when you become subject to disciplinary action, lawsuits and things like that. But generally speaking, you can do stuff and chances are <laughs> nobody's gonna look over your shoulder. Uh, the client will, of course, but the client will trust you. Um, and it's, it's if something goes wrong that people then look to see if, 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 the, if the, the accident was because of negligence, professional negligence or incompetence. And sometimes it's just an act of, of God or a natural disaster or something that can't be helped. But if it's found out that you know Collins is doing designed to trust, and he doesn't even know how to do trust calculations, <laughs> what is he doing with it? You know, then I could be in big trouble. Yeah. I did want to ask, how is this different than, and I think you mentioned in the past for when you become a professional engineer, that there is legal protection, that they will stand behind you, and if your employer tries to mention that your work is subpar, they'll stand behind you. Uh, where does, where I guess, where does that intersect with uh, an investigation, like say if something would they, in that case, would you not have any protection if they can prove, I guess, that you're, in that case, they'd be proving you'd be incompetent, correct? <laughs> Essentially, or that there was negligence? Yes, uh, and, and you have to carry insurance. If you're a consultant, and that's your primary income, there's uh, uh, in insurance that you would need to carry, and National Society of Professional Engineers helps us to get that in insurance to protect us. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's just like a, a doctor has to have malpractice insurance, and, and that's a cost. That's a cost that we have to bear if we're not working for an employer that bears that cost uh, for us. And so we should be insured. Um, but, uh, you know, when it comes to like a whistleblowing, where I mean, as a professional engineer, if we, we make a recommendation on a design, and our, our boss says, no, this is too expensive, you need to take out that bracket, you need to reduce uh, the number of components here, you need to substitute cheaper, less expensive metal. And you're looking at that saying, I, I don't know, you know, I did the load calculations and I, I, I'm not comfortable. I am not comfortable with what you're telling me to do. You have an obligation, an ethical obligation as a professional engineer to refuse to do something that you you believe in your judgment and you can document it that it's it's dangerous it, it's it does not meet the standard of you know good engineering design that you that you learned and uh, if you don't stand up then somebody could report you you know another professional engineer might say well, Collins gave into the boss and took took this bracket out and in my judgment, that's endangering the design, the integrity of the design, and it will endanger people. That My colleague could report me to the licensing board and say, Collins had the responsibility to stand up, and he didn't do it. And then I might be subject to you know, a fine or having my license revoked for some period of time. That does not happen very often. Um, but uh, yeah, so even if we're in, a, in a, a, a company, like working for Boeing, and we have that license, and we're licensed by the state, uh, we have responsibilities that are above and beyond what the non-licensed engineer would have. And we can help be held accountable for that by, I mean, we're accountable to Boeing because they're our employer, but we have this other source of accountability as well. Um, and, uh, yeah, so it's, you know, there's some gray areas, but generally, it's very rare that these issues come up, so it's, it's not something that um, many, many, many li uh, licensed engineers never even stand drawings or designs. They, they're, they're licensed for other reasons, or they give expert testimony, or they're teaching in a university. Uh, there's a, been a long, long time been a push to require that university professors be licensed, and that, that's not going anywhere. I think one state, I, I do think the state of Wyoming requires that professors of engineering have to be licensed. It stands to reason, I think architects have to be a professor of architecture, professors of law, and certainly medical uh, doctors who teach have to be licensed in their respective fields. Why would a professor of engineering not have to be licensed? Um, 
but that that's a very difficult conversation. Um, we're actually unusual here in that we have several licensed faculty. Myself, Professor Bridge, uh, Professor Johnson is a licensed uh, professional engineer. And that's really unusual. Like that's that's a significant fraction of our teaching faculty. Um, and for mechanical engineering, now you would, might find that in civil, um, but it's it's unusual. And I think it's a testament to the dean. Our former dean was a mechanical engineer who was our founding dean. She was a big supporter in getting faculty licensed. But anyway, uh, yeah, so I, I tried to expand upon the answers here. And then when we get to the e economics, I just I'll put the solutions up here. And you see a lot of these are you know, using the factor formula, you, uh, and you look up the uh, you look up the factor in the interest rate table. In some cases where you have an odd interest rate, you might have to use the formula that's in the first page, the actual uh, really long formula that has I and N in it. But usually it's more the most convenient thing is to use the, the interest rate tables. Yes, sir? Um, just really quick, going back to question five. Uh -huh. I put uh, the, May, the May design in electrical engineering gives you those confidence, but I understand that the, um, the actual answer is depending on the initial situation of the job. Why is that? Why is it that if they feel confident that they, no matter the magnitude or the size of the job, why shouldn't they apply themselves as a task to like be small ethically? Do, do like yeah, it's... You might have talked about it. Yeah. It's, it's the so. Well, you get into issues of, uh, you know, my colleague might be a uh, professional, you know, consulting electrical engineer and she needs work. And if I'm out there saying, you know, well, I'm a mechanical engineer, but I, I can compete with her. I, I, my electrical is just as good as hers. That's not fair to her. She's a, her, her, she's licensed in electrical. I'm licensed in mechanical. So there's a, there's a problem there of me uh, uh, competing unfairly with my fellow engineer. Um, but there's just also the fact that, you know, I, why, why, why would I be as a licensed mechanical engineer um, <laughs> doing electrical project you know, where electrical is the main focus? Um, that would be, yeah. And then the feeling. See, this is this gets to the profession part that we we're the judge of our competence. So if I feel confident, then society grants me that right to say that. But if something goes wrong, that's they'll check. <laughs> that's when you okay prove it. But you don't have to prove it up front. It's assumed that you that you are. Another thing about uh, being licensed, it, it protects the client because if the client, if I do an HVAC job, and uh, from a, a client hires me to do an HVAC job, and then the HVAC system doesn't work, um, then the client finds out Collins is he's a PE licensed in mechanical design. He's not licensed in HVAC. Yeah, I'm a licensed mechanical engineer. But why would I be practicing HVAC if I'm licensed in mechanical design? So that could subject the client to liability. And so my, my being licensed in my, my area that I'm offering services in, that protects the client as well as me. Where this has come up, because I know some people who run into this, um, you can get licensed in control systems. There's a, you can get a PD in control systems. And uh, I, quite a few people do this who are licensed. They, they have a license in mechanical or chemical or electrical, but they get that extra license in control systems in, in, in large measure to protect the client. Okay, I'm doing control systems work, and yeah, that's part of our education as mechanical engineers. It's assumed we can do controls. But having that license in, in controls, it, it, it it signifies that I have this special competency in controls, and um, it helps to protect the client in case something happens. That was actually explained to me by a colleague who is a licensed, he's licensed in electrical and in, uh, controls, and he primarily does controls on uh, large, uh, like dams and energy, but especially hydro. Uh, yeah, so, um, I thought about that controls because I, I, I that's I've done 
I haven't done controls work recently, but I, I did that a lot earlier in my career. And um, I actually started looking at what the exam had, uh, what, what the exam content was. I was like, oh my god, I can't remember any of this. You, you all might do that. <laughs> I'd have to really spend a lot of time on that. That's probably not time that would be well spent. Anyway, um, I'll leave this to you to check your work and see how, uh, unless you have any specific questions. We'll move on to thermo. Um, I do have some practice problems for us to do in class here. Um, yeah, thermo is <coughs> thermo is huge. I don't know if you, you had a chance to look through my notes or go through the section in the in the, in the FE manual, but it is it is gigantic. And the reason it's so big, I'll tell you this. Back uh, in 2014, there was a big revision to the, uh, to the exam. They shortened it from eight hours to what it is now. What it's five hours and 20 minutes? Six hours with lunch and things like that. But it used to be eight hours with a 30 minute. So I guess they took about an hour off of it. And they took out a lot of the breadth stuff. Um, it used to be, for example, chemicals. Chemical engineers had, had, had a section in statics. and. Uh, Uh, mechanicals have a section in chemistry and, and biology. Actually, mechanical and chemistry have a biology section. <laughs> biology. Biology? And uh, they had this revision and they took that stuff out. Um, it helped electrical a lot because the electrical, if you were taking the FE and electrical, it had thermo. And almost no electricals take thermo anymore. But back in my day, they did. Everybody took thermo, and everybody should take thermo. Good grief, it is the foundation of all engineering. What is it that we do? If we don't do anything else, we are messing with energy, right? We're converting energy from one form to another. And we, every engineer needs to understand, every, to me, every educated person really needs that. That's the one course that I would, if I were the ruler of the universities, every major, Got to take thermo. Maybe we'd have a thermo for non science or non engineers, but it's just that important the first and second law because without that knowledge, we can't really wrap our brains around environmental issues and pollution and CO2. And why is it so hard? Why can't we just take a filter and take the CO2 out of the air? Why can't we just burn fuels without giving any CO2 off at all? You know, why is there heat? Why, why, why does friction? You know, why is it every time we do something, we heat things up? And without a good thermo class, that would be... Uh... But electricals used to have to uh, do that, and they, had, and they had to take some other subject areas too, but they had a really low pass rate. You look at the pass rates for of the FE and 60, 70 percent, then you see the electricals 50, <laughs> 52 percent. I was like, well, maybe we need to do something. To... So they took out... Uh, they really made it more specialized now, so we're not taking doing subjects outside of our uh, our area. But what they did with the th uh, thermo when they took chemistry out, they they actually took part of chemistry and mixed it with the thermo, and that's why the thermo section got so big, is it has a bunch of chemistry in it, and uh, so problems that might look like chemistry problems now, uh, you'll see in, in the thermo section, like general chem problems. Um, but anyway, it is a it is a big uh, subject area, so you, you can expect to have a you know, good chunk of the exam. At least a tenth of the exam is going to be thermo problems. Um, so it's up there with uh, machine design and, and, and dynamics is you know a really big piece. And uh, of course, it covers much more than we can do in a single quarter of uh, of thermo. Um, and then it has that chemistry some of that chemistry stuff in there as well. Um, yeah, I mean, until 2020, just recently, they, they, they changed the exam. And until 2020, the mechanicals hadn't, uh, were expected to know solution chemistry, like Henry's Law, and what happens when you, you know, what, what, what happens when salt dissolves in water, it gives off heat, how do you calculate that, and um, uh, Henry's Law and uh, Raoult's Law, that, I, I don't know, you might have had that in general chem. That's gone. They took that out in 2020. So we don't have to worry about that mess. They also took out compressible flow. 
until 2020, uh, the pressable flow is part of the exam. That's gone. And uh, so it is streamlined a little bit more. Um, but uh, probably, I think that the dip most difficult part for people coming out of quarter systems is going to be this part here because we don't really cover this in just the, the, the thermo class. Unless you take an HVAC class, you might not cover that very much. But I think it, the other thing, in combustion, I didn't cover combustion until maybe a year or two ago. I added it in, and, and still sometimes I can't fit it in, especially the winter quarter, because we have less class meetings. It's a shorter time period, so combustion. Um, but I think that the, most of the problems are going to be the fundamentals, you know, properties and cha uh, changes in uh, the processes and things like that. So knowing about its intensive properties and uh, how, to, how to calculate properties, how to look them up in tables, using uh, using uh, phase diagrams, there's a bunch of tables and phase diagrams in the thermo section of the handbook, and uh, you know remembering quirky things like. Uh, you know, how to look up properties for subcooled liquids, and making sense of phase diagrams. Um, and uh, it's good to practice using the reference manual only because their tables are, are, are a little bit unusual. They look different from our the thermo tables we use in class, and it can be awkward to work with them. Um, so to, just getting used to the, how the properties are presented uh, in their tables and uh, you know some things you know how to make sense of what, what the different phases are and where they're located on the phase diagram and you know little rules for determining what the phase is when you have some property data and uh, so I have some examples here uh, quite a few examples in my presentation um, I have some more to give to you to do to do as practice. So I, I'm going to go through these fast so we can go and practice, uh, have us practice in here. But this is just an example of, uh, you know, the, you understand enthalpy. What is enthalpy? Well, it's U plus PV. If you don't remember that, there's a formula for it. So all these formulas are in the reference handbook. It's just knowing where to go, where to find the formula. Um, so when we're given internal energy, and some information about pressure and you know, volume. So it's just using this formula. And uh, we're straight up given the internal energy and then the pressure uh, for, for atmosphere. So I, for some reason, they like atmosphere as a unit. So just multiply four times 100 kPa, 101 kPa. Um, and then uh, volume, and of course, they're given the weird units to annoy us further and force us to do ridiculous unit conversions, um, meters to cubic meters. So 1.77 kilojoules. Um, and, uh, and then be careful because we're asked for the specific enthalpy, so we have to divide by mass. And, uh, and another thing to notice, and you probably noticed this on the first quiz, is that it, most of the time you, the you're not gonna get an exact answer. It's gonna be rounded, and you'll get something. You have to choose the nearest answer. And the question will often say what most nearly, or what approximately is, and, and then you just have to hope that your calculation comes out close enough that you can rule out. Because I've seen some where it's like, yeah, right in between, which one do I choose? That happened to me, I remember that. Way back when I did the chemical one, several problems. I was like right in the middle. And uh, I, I probably did something wrong, but I had to make a guess. Which one? Uh, so a rigid tank contains 10 kilograms of water. But what's the pressure? So here is, you know, can we use the property table uh, competently? And uh, so we, we to use the property table. Uh, we would get specific volume because we can look that up. And go to the water table in the reference handbook and uh, 160 degrees um, specific volume of pure liquid pure vapor we see we're in between so we've got a saturated mixture 
So this is checking to see, can we do quality? Do we know what quality is? Can we calculate quality? Can we discern when a, when a, a state is a saturated state versus a you know, superheated or subcooled? And uh, so specific volume in the middle, we conclude we have a mixture. And once we, once we know it's saturated, we just look at the saturation pressure that's uh, in the table beside the temperature, and uh, that would be our answer. We don't even have to calculate the quality. We're just reading the pressure right out of the table here. Um, so using the charts, with, with water and refrigerant, we use the tables, maybe the phase diagrams, but for ideal gases, we use the ideal gas equation, and we might get this in uh, the form where we use mass, uh, or we might get it in the sort of the chemistry form where we have moles and the universal gas constant. Um, we might get a compressibility problem where you have to calculate compressibility factor um, and then determine whether a gas is ideal or non ideal based on that. Um, and then properties of ideal gases we have all of these what are called state equations or equations of state for ideal gases undergoing various processes. And the ones given in the handbook, and these, they're all listed there, so you can look them up, you know, how to calculate change in the entropy. Um, and then these are, these are equations of state for isotropic processes, right, where you don't have an entropy change. And uh, there, there are no, all of the problems that I've seen, to my knowledge, um, that involve ideal gas processes assume constant specific heat. There are no air tables or, or ideal gas property tables. So uh, the assumption of constant specific heat, and that's when you can use these equations. They're, they're limited to when you can assume constant specific heat. And that's all we need to, to, to know. And uh, there's tables that have specific heat and you know R and, and other properties for a handful of gases that you might encounter. Um, so here's an example of a balloon. We're given a diameter that expands. So it goes through a process of expansion under the influence of sunlight, and we want to know the final temperature. Okay, so remember how to do this. You know, you have the P1, V1 over our MRT1 equals P2, V2 over MRT2, and so on. This has to be constant for an ideal gas because this relation is equal to Z, and Z is always constant for an ideal gas. And so you can relate to you can relate a process between two states that way. And since the only two things varying here are volume and, and temperature, um, we can solve this for T2 and eliminate the variables that don't change and uh, and then you know this is another thing you might run into is you have to calculate volumes and areas of, of geometric objects there is a table there is information in the math section if you go to the mathematics section it'll have all of the area formulas volume formulas for cylinders spheres uh, 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 funnel uh, um, what do you call the triangular pyramids and things like that. So it's all, you just have to be able to find it, and that's where this comes from here. Um, and then um, getting the, the answer, you know, remembering we always use Kelvin, always absolute, always absolute pressure and absolute temperature. So be mindful of you know, getting everything into absolute units. And then uh, in this case, we have to go back to, to, to BC First and second laws, um, I think all the problems are gonna be steady state. That's really what we assume in, in, in the first thermo class at least. And remembering our, um, our first law, for how we, what our model uh, for conservation of energy is for closed systems, the only way we can change energy of a system is by changing its internal energy, its kinetic energy, its potential energy, and that has to equal you know, whatever it is we're doing. This is how we mess with the system, and this is how the system responds to our messing with it. Um, so that's for closed system. And most of the time, uh, most cases, 
no change in kinetic or potential energy. And, uh, and look for special cases, polytropic, isothermal, uh, and so on. And, uh, and we can use you know, special formula to, to calculate work, for example, for isobaric process, isothermal. Uh, and then for open systems, we have uh, the additional energy term that goes with moving a fluid. That's the PV term. U plus PV is H. So uh, U gets replaced with H in our for, for open systems. Conservation model, conservation of mass, energy in equal, uh, equals energy out in a steady, steady state. And again, look for special cases where terms go to zero or we have simple formula. Um, and especially for pump work. And then there are special forms for determining uh, or applying the first law when we have nozzles, compressors, turbines. And if you have my notes from Thermo, you'll find sections in my notes where I, you know, I, I, I have these equations and examples of the different kinds of how we use them. So here's an isentropic turbine. Steam goes in um, and it leaves, goes at high pressure, leaves low pressure, and quality of 0.94. What is the power? So here, the challenge is going to be using the table when we have enthalpy out equals enthalpy in. Okay, so that state, the state on the outlet is determined by the pressure, which is one, well, actually, this is a. <coughs> Yeah, we're given we're given the, 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 the quality here, which is uh, it seems like there's more information than we actually need here. But so here's the application of conservation of energy. Work is m dot delta h, and um, and then we look these we look up our enthalpy in the tables. And then the entropy and then the entropy coming out which uh, we can use the quality the exit entropy so we use a superheated water table for the inlet state, and, and then we plug in our variables once we've gotten them out of the tables, and we get uh, 596 kilowatts, closest to 600. Um, and here's a, uh, a problem involving a piston. So here's a closed system, an isentropic process. We're, pr uh, we're compressing from 150 kPa to 300 kPa given the specific heat and the, the specific heat is constant so what is near, most nearly the final temperature we can use the relation here for an ideal gas when there's an isotropic process and we can calculate K from the given information and then solve for T2 and convert back to C. Okay. So first and second laws, the first law of conservation of energy, conservate are the uh, uh, second law is the entropy balance. There is not conservation of energy or conservation of entropy in an actual process. Uh, entropy is generated internally. And so the entropy uh, leaving the, the, the entropy generation uh, term is unless the process is reversible. Uh, entropy will be generated and it's captured in the entropy generation term, which we can solve for uh, if we know, have other information about the, the process. So how can entropy change if it's a closed system? Entropy changes only due to in internal generation, just something sitting, you know, all the molecules colliding in the system and you're just watching it. Entropy is continually being generated, but then we can remove entropy or add entropy by heat transfer. Whenever you put heat, you heat something, you're 
entropy is going in, cool something, entropy is coming out. And then for an open system, we have we can do this, but we can also, you know, mass conveys it, entropy just as it conveys entropy. And so when mass goes in, mass comes out, uh, entropy goes in and out with that mass. And in steady state, this is zero. In isotropic processes, delta S is zero. Um, and if the process is isothermal, um, then delta S is Q over T. And these are, these are all in the, the reference handbook. You just have to know where to go to get them. We have isentropic processes for turbines, nozzles, and pumps. This takes into account how entropy you know, robs us of work if we're, we're trying to get work out of the system. The actual work will be less than the work if it were isentropic. If it's a pump, we're going to have to put more work in. So the actual work going in will be larger than the isentropic work. And so we can use the isentropic efficiencies to determine how close our devices come to being reversible. Availability. This is something I don't do anymore in uh, in thermo. Is, is this idea of exergy? And uh, you might get a problem where you have to calculate the uh, exergy of a system. And what the exergy is, it is a way of it's a, it's an easy way to quantify how much work can I get out of this system. What's the theoretically maximum work that I can get out of the system? And, uh, and we can calculate that. Um, it, it's actually the, the total energy change as you, as you go from this, the actual system conditions to the surrounding condition. So if you can imagine a ball rolling down a hill or you're dropping something, so your actual system is you're holding it up and then it falls and it, it lands, it, hits the, it bottoms out. In exergy language, that's called the dead state. And the subscript L indicates the dead state. So if you have a, uh, you know, a balloon and it's compressed, right? This balloon is at a high pressure relative to the surrounding. The system in that balloon would be U, S, and V, and then the surrounding, U, L, S, L, and V, L, and the the energy that's the potential, the work potential in that balloon. You would, you would, it would be manifest if you pop the balloon and you suddenly, the system falls to the dead state. It goes in, it becomes, it goes in equilibrium with the surrounding. That, the change in these variables would be captured by the, exer, uh, by the exergy term or also called availability. And then the maximum, if the system is going, uh, the changing states relative to the surrounding, then the, the exergy differential is, uh, well, it should be a, a, a two minus one, state two minus state one. And uh, there's open system exergy, which uh, just adds the kinetic energy and the potential energy. And then the irreversibility is the maximum work from the reversible process minus the actual work. I used to cover, I, actually I did cover this in some, sometimes when I taught thermo, it's a chapter in our textbook, but um, I, I, went, I, I got rid of it, just not enough time to do other, you know, other things. And uh, so here's an isentropic efficiency of a pump. We're given a, a, the specific work that's required. This is our, uh, how we calculate for the ideal pump, reversible work, specific volume, which is constant with the liquid, times the change in the pressure. And uh, because of liquids are relatively incompressible, we assume constant specific volume. And, uh, and we can look that specific volume up. Or in many cases, if we're dealing with water near room temperature between you know, freezing and 100 degrees Fahrenheit, you know, we can just use the density of water, 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter, invert that 0 0.001 cubic meters per kilogram 
but we can also look it up in the table if you want a more accurate measure. And, uh, and that's it. And that's it. You have the specific volume, the pressure. Uh, we, we know we're going uh, to uh, 1,500 to 15,000 kPa, and that's our specific work. Pumps don't require a whole lot of energy. You can see that we're changing pressure by a factor of 10, but the specific work is actually quite small. And then the isentropic efficiency would be the actual, um, not, I'm sorry, the reversible work that we just calculated divided by the actual, which is 15 or 0.91. Okay. Here's a nozzle diffuser problem, where here the, uh, the application of the first law is just uh, you know energy in equals energy out, and this is one of the cases where kinetic energy is you know a, a, a very important. Of course, a diffuser, we're slowing down a fluid, and we're slowing down the fluid by changing its enthalpy. And um, it's, it's kind of like uh, you take taking a fire hose. You know, with water, and you just hit a wall with that hose. What, what, how does that? How does? How is the water changing state? It's coming. It's, it's a high velocity when it comes out of the hose. It's zero velocity when it hits the wall. Where did that energy go? And uh, it went into the increasing temperature. The temperature increase, the pressure increase, and that's captured in the change in the enthalpy here. Um, but here we're looking for the velocity coming out, we're going in at 120 meters per second, so we would expect to come out slower. Diffuser's always on the front end of the jet engine, the turbojet engine, because the first thing you have to do to the air coming in is slow it down before you put it into the compressor. When you slow it down, you increase the pressure, so you're, you're helping the compressor, you're reducing the amount of compressor work, and you're also, you can't have air, you're going at 600 miles an hour through your engine, it's not going to have time to ignite and burn and, and, and build up the energy. So we solve uh, our, our energy balance for the exit velocity. And, uh, and here we make that substitution um, because we don't have a, a nitrogen table. We don't have an ideal gas table for nitrogen and all the different temperatures. We use uh, CP delta T. And we can look up uh, CP plug everything in and uh, these kind of with diffusers and nozzles we have a little awkward unit conversion here because one of our terms uh, in this case uh, the enthalpy is in kilojoules per kilogram but we need to convert it to meter squared over second squared so we can we can add it to the square of the velocity here so we have to do a conversion first from kilojoules to joules and then from joules per kilogram to meter squared second squared and uh, then we find that our velocity 43.8 so we slowed down from 120 to 43.8 meters per second okay is this bringing back happy memories or <laughs> bad, bad memories. Um, and all your, your favorite power cycles are represented uh, in refrigeration cycles and more formula. So efficiencies for a uh, general efficiency for a power cycle. Um, and then the Cardo, the ideal version of each of the cycles over here. So refrigeration, we use the coefficient of performance. And uh, and then for the Cardo version, we can just replace QH with TH, QL with TL, and that gives us our ideal performance metric. Now, uh, the handbook will, the reference handbook actually has diagrams of all the cycles, so you don't have to memorize what they look like, you know, the phase diagrams, the auto cycle. And you know, it might help to know that the auto cycle is a uh, You know, we, have, we have two constant volume processes 
Um, so two, two to three is a constant volume. This is the in, this is the heat addition, and then the exhaust heat removal happens in constant volume. So we have two volumes in an auto cycle, and that enables us to calculate this useful ratio, the uh, compression ratio of an engine is the maximum volume over the minimum volume. And uh, in my heat cycle, did I not have the Brayton? I don't see the Brayton cycle, maybe it's coming up here. Vapor compression refrigeration, and I missed the Brayton cycle. Cascade refrigeration is, uh, we don't really do this uh, because we don't have time to really, we get the refrigeration at the tail end of the class, but if you have uh, big refrigeration needs, you can actually cascade refrigeration systems and like you use different refrigerants. So you might have a, a refrigerant that works best at, um, this would be a relatively high temperature, and then another refrigerant that works best at a colder temperature, and you can stack these up. Yes? I did want to ask, do we have to also know the diesel cycle, or is that not all they would say? Oh, jeez. Yeah. Just because um, I remember auto was for internal combustion engine for gas, and then diesel was. I don't, yeah, I think. I just remember the pressures were a lot higher for diesel, and I think the equations were slightly different. Yeah. I think if you, I think auto, it looks like auto, Carno Auto Rankine. Okay, so for compression. Okay, so then I guess these will know that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, just surprising if there's not a break. Yeah, but that's the ones that are given. Um, yeah, but these are, well, this is showing very unusual and not very commonly used refrigeration cycles. In fact, this one is really only commonly used. So it's only used, well, it is used in, in uh, cryogenic applications where you really need cold down to absolute, near absolute zero, a Brayton cycle, a Brayton refrigeration cycle. But where you most commonly see this is in an airplane, kind of cooling the uh, cabins of uh, commercial airplanes. That's the only major application I know of, 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 of uh, the reverse Brayton cycle Certainly in the case of, uh, for air conditioning. Um, and, um, and then here's an example of um, the Rankine cycle. And um, in this case, you're given the cycle diagram and even given the enthalpies. So we don't have to look things up. We just have to know how to work our way around the cycle and, and do calculations with the given quantities. So what is the thermal efficiency here? And uh, so uh, the general uh, expression for thermal efficiency for any power cycle is work, a thermal power cycle work out over heat in. And uh, so work out would be H3 minus H4. So the, the work that's developed is developed in the turbine. So as we change the state of the, uh, of, the, of, the, of the steam through the turbine, we're extracting energy, that's H3 minus H4. But then we want net work, because we're putting work into the pump. This is very small, usually relative to the turbine work, often we ignore it. But in this case, because we're given the information, we include an H2 minus H1 over the heat, and the heat is added between states uh, two and three going through the boiler. And uh, so it's really plugging in given information. Thermal efficiency, uh, be alert to a problem like this that looks hard, but it's actually uh, pretty simple because uh, we can use the, uh, the shortcut formula when we have constant specific heat or cold air standard. And all of these cycles are gonna be cold air standard which means we can use the simplifying formula, so the auto cycle one minus R to the uh, one minus K, 
and, and so the efficiency is solely a function of the compression ratio and the specific heat ratio K. Uh, remember, 1.4 is, is K for air. You can look it up, but it, 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 it's a, that's a number of Ks to remember if you're doing a lot of engine uh, work. Um, and uh, it's just plugging in. Uh, R is 10. Point six would be our ideal efficiency, and uh, power uh, the refrigeration cycles, the, the evaporator that's absorbing thermal energy from the space we're cooling. We come out of the evaporator, and the ideal vapor compression cycle is saturated vapor. We compress it to superheated vapor, condense at constant pressure. A liquid, a saturated liquid, and then expand that liquid, throttle it in a constant enthalpy throttling process back down through the evaporation pressure. So, in a, a, a refrigeration cycle, we have two pressures generally the high pressure side and the low pressure side. And the compressor and, and the expansion valve form the down, down here with cold, low pressure, up here with hot and high pressure. So, high pressure gas, high pressure liquid low pressure gas, low pressure saturated mixture, right? Usually about 0.3 is the quality going into the evaporator. And then where the action takes place is we're, we're, drawing, we're using the surrounding, the energy in the surrounding to vaporize the liquid here so that it's all vapor by the time we come out of the evaporator. And then this is what it looks like on the... Now, what... Uh, you, you might see in a, okay, well, this is just giving us pressures, 40, 100 PSIA. Um, and what I rarely have time to do in thermo is make use of the pH diagram. This is uh, mainly what we use in HVAC. And if you're in the HVAC class, we're going to look at this on Monday and do some refrigeration problems using the pH diagram. Uh, and we have these for all man, all refrigerants, manner of refrigerants. And they're very easy to use. It's, it greatly simplifies refrigeration and air conditioning analysis. You see the familiar vapor dome here, saturated liquid curve, saturated vapor curve. Um, so you've got saturated mixture in here, superheated vapor over here and pressure off on the side and enthalpy down here. Now in refrigeration, we're generally operating between a high pressure and a low pressure. And so you can set those, you know, one line is gonna be your low pressure line, then you have the high pressure line, this will be the evaporator pressure and the condenser pressure up above. So at 40 PSI, here's our, our just our, our isobar, and then our, uh, our upper pressure was 200, that's our condenser pressure. So this is our operating region between those two red lines. And this is the state you leave the evaporator is saturated vapor in the ideal cycle. And one to two, an isentropic compression. How do we do that? Well, conveniently, there are lines of constant entropy. These lines here, constant entropy lines. So to do a, a isentropic process, we just follow a line of constant en entropy up to the desired outlet pressure. So these are our lines of constant entropy. And so we, we zip on up at constant entropy going parallel to a, a, an entropy line to our desired exit state. So there's our state coming out of the compressor. You can see we're just a little bit superheated, 200 PSI, and we're, we're quite hot. These curves here are temperature. So you can see one, uh, one, 120, 140, about one, 120, so 140. So we're close to 140 degrees coming out. And now we do, we go through the condenser. That's constant pressure. But first we're gonna desuperheat. We're gonna bring this temperature down to the saturation temperature, and then we're gonna Go all the way to saturated liquid until we're up on the, uh, on, the, on, the, on the liquid curve 
there. So there's our, our state coming out of the condenser. And now we're going to throttle, bring it back to that starting pressure, the evaporator pressure. We go through the throttling, and this is going to cool. It's going to cool the, 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 the and, and condense a good chunk of that. Um, or actually, it's going to vaporize, because we're already pure liquid here. We drop the pressure, so some of that refrigerant flashes into the vapor phase at constant enthalpy. So when you go vertical, it's got enthalpy here, a vertical process is constant enthalpy. So you can see how easy and convenient it is to represent what refrigeration using this type of diagram. And then we go through the evaporator. But you can see here, going into the evaporator, we're in the mixed zone, and you can actually see what our quality is. There's our quality. So I see I've got refrigerant at about 0.38 quality. And uh, so that means it's 38% vapor by mass. So I've got that, you know, the remaining 62% that I, I can evaporate by absorbing heat from the surrounding to take me to the vapor state there. Okay, so there it is. So you can see on these diagrams, refrigeration processes look like little trapezoids. What, one, what, kind of half trapezoid. This, this line, and then that would be vertical. And it's much better than having to interpolate. It's usually with uh, refrigeration processes, if we only use the tables, we end up having to do some interpolation. And um, so this is just uh, looking at sort of representing processes here and then putting some numbers on them. It is hard to be accurate. You, you can't. Or, uh, you can only be so precise as you read the uh, numbers off. Them. So labeling, and then coming back and doing our calculations, plugging in, we get 3.6 from the COP. So you remember how to do this, but but you might have to do it using the tables. But I think uh, you'll be just as likely to see, uh, have a problem using the phase diagram. Um, and in the interest of time here, because I I, I want to have some time to do some practice problems. I'm going to skip over some. This is the refrigerant table, and they give it give us refrigerant uh, for give us tables for 134A and 410A. 410 is the common refrigerant used in residential air conditioning. Um, I think most residential systems use it. We're trying to start phasing this out because it it is a greenhouse gas. It's a powerful greenhouse gas, um, but it has ideal properties for household type application. And uh, you see it has uh, you know, pressure on the left side. This is a, a, a saturation temperature here, the bubble temperature. And then it has enthalpy, and it has a bunch of other stuff as well. So it looks a little different than our thermo book, how it organizes, but all the same stuff is in there. Um, and uh, let's see. Psychrometrics. In, in ideal gases. This is something that will be new, um, I think, in unit. We haven't done. Uh, like we might uh, do a little bit of this in thermo, but we did it more in the HVAC class. So being able to describe a mixture of ideal gases in terms of mole fractions and partial pressures and things like that, applying Dalton's law, um, describing atmospheric air, which is a, a mixture of water vapor and dry air, and doing some basic air conditioning calculations. In air conditioning applications, it's just the application of the first law, but to the specific case of heating and cooling buildings, building air. Um, so here we have an ideal gas mixture, and we want to find the, the mole the mass fraction of butane given mole fractions, so we have to convert from mole to mass. These formula are, are given in the, in the reference handbook, so you can just look them up. We need the molar mass of each component, and uh, x being the mass or the, the mole fraction using the, the notation of the handbook. And then plugging, plugging them in, we're interested in 
uh, the mole fraction of butane, so 0.39 times the molar mass of butane, and then we just sum all of the components in the denominator. So doing these kind of calculations, and this is one where we're looking at, uh, we're given the total pressure and the total volume, we want to know what the temperature is, so we have to apply the ideal gas equation with Dalton's law. Dalton's law says that the total pressure of an ideal gas mixture is the sum of the partial pressures of each component. Each component contributes uh, to the total pressure, and you sum them up to get the total pressure. Using the psychrometric chart. Now, I, you may or may not have a problem. I, my sense from talking to people who've taken the exam is uh, th th this is may or may not be there. So whether it's worth your time to mess around with it, um, I, I don't know. But I don't think it's going to be a central feature of the exam. Um, I think there's there's wide recognition that for many mechanical engineers that just don't study this stuff in their undergraduate curriculum. But I don't know. You could see some problems. And uh, so when we are dealing with air conditioning and psychrometrics, the key point here is air now. It's not dry air anymore like it was in thermo. It is air plus water vapor. Air plus water. It's a mixture of air and water. And so we have to take those, both of those components into account, vapor and air. So the total pressure, air pressure, is the sum of the partial pressure of air, partial pressure of vapor. The partial pressure of the vapor, and sometimes this is called vapor pressure. It's just the pressure of the water vapor. It's very small in air. It's very small, but it, 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 it's consequential. Water vapor in air is superheated. It's low pressure superheated steam. We live in a sea of superheated steam diluted in dry air. And uh, then there's definitions here uh, that we talk a lot about in, in HVAC. So if you're taking HVAC, well, you're going to be on top of this. You're going to wish that they give you a bunch of these because it's going to be fresh. Um, but if you're not taking HVAC, this might, you might wonder what this is all about. But there are different temperatures that we use to characterize air based on its moisture content, dew point temperature. That's the temperature when you cool this air. So we take this air and we cool it, cool it at constant pressure. When will we start to condense water? And when we condense water, we make rain or we make dew. And, and that'll happen at a temperature called the dew point temperature. And it's always less than the dry bulb temperature, which is just the regular air temperature. And, uh, uh, and this other stuff I'm not going to even talk about. Um, humidity ratio, this is the ratio of the mass of water vapor in the air to the mass of dry air. So this gives us a quantitative indicator. All right, how much, how much water is in the air relative to the dry air on a mass basis? And, uh, and we can actually convert, or we can calculate that uh, 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 humidity ratio if we know what the partial pressure of the water vapor is. We're gonna partial pressure of the water vapor, and the total pressure, which is just atmospheric pressure, 14.7 or 101 ppa, and we can calculate out the uh, humidity ratio, and then the relative humidity, which we hear in weather reports, 50%, 60%, 30%, uh, is the ratio of the vapor pressure in the air to the saturation pressure at the temperature of the air. And this we look up in in the water table, the water property table, we just go to the temperature. If it's 70 degrees in the classroom, we go to 70 degrees in the water table, and we see what is the pressure, the saturation pressure corresponding to 70 degrees, and that would be PDG, and that ratio is the humidity. And then we multiply by 100 to say it's 50%. You 100% know, relative humidity means that these two are equal. The air is saturated. And we can't put any more water. The air can't hold any more water. It'll, it'll just condense out. And then the enthalpy of 
the moist air is the sum of the enthalpy of the dry air component plus the enthalpy of the water times the humidity ratio. And uh, so this is an example problem here. Um, I think these questions are going to be pretty simple. Um, and it's just going to be finding the formula, knowing a little bit about the concept, and then going to the formula that has that matches the given information and solving it for what we're asking for here. So the dew point temperature is the saturation temperature corresponding to the vapor pressure. So we can get the vapor pressure from the relative humidity. So the vapor pressure is the humidity times the saturation pressure at 25 degrees C. And we look this up in the table, the water table at 25 degrees C and calculate our vapor pressure. <coughs> And then at that, at that, that this vapor pressure corresponds to a temperature of 5 degrees C. So that would be the dew point temperature, the temperature at which we would start to condense water out of the air. All of this is, is actually easier when you have a psychrometric chart. This is a chart that has all the properties of water or, or of moist air. So if you know any two properties, like if I know the temperature, the air temperature is down here. Just the dry bulb temperature, 20 degrees, 30 degrees C, 40 degrees C, and then tell me something else. It's 25 degrees. Let's say it's 20 degrees because I can't really read this. It's blurry to me from here. This is 20 degrees, and let's say it's 60% relative humidity. That's 60 or 40. 60, maybe that's 60 right there. So if I know it's uh, 20 degrees C and 60% relative humidity, that's my state point for this air. So I put a little dot there, and then I can go up here and read off the enthalpy of this air. I can get its specific volume from these lines. I can get the humidity ratio, which is off here on the right. And if I, then if I do a, a constant moisture cooling, I go all the way to the left. When I hit the saturation curve, this is a saturation curve. When the humidity is 100%, that's my dew point temperature. So the dew point temperature would be what? About, I don't know, I can't read it. It's just all blurred to me. But that's the psychometric chart. And there's, you know, to show you uh, uh, in here how to use that. Um, and so I would encourage you to just kind of step through that. Here's how we locate the state point, right? And then we look up the properties at the different, there's the enthalpy. And then there's some questions here. But you know, this is your call. I think it's even less likely that you'll get an air conditioning process. I, I can't imagine. I don't know. It's in the book. They say that you need, you, this is something you should know. But this is like week three, week two, week three HVAC stuff. Um, but anyway, probably something you should know is that uh, when you have a, your state, you have, you, you have a point on the psychometric chart. Let's say this is our room right now. No, I guess this is our room right now. It's really hot. What is it? 35 degrees. We've got really hot, muggy air. 35 degrees and 60% uh, relative humidity. Man, that's really nasty stuff. I want to cool it. I want my air here. This is what it is now, and I want it here. Here is 25 degrees and 50% relative humidity. This is a... People like their buildings at this temperature and humidity. So how do I go from there to here? Well, I have to cool, which means I go left to cool, lower the temperature, and then I have to take water out of the air. I have to dehumidify, and that's a vertical motion. So to get from here to here, I have to cool and dehumidify. And what the, the air conditioner is doing that simultaneously, the cooling and the dehumidification, and the HVAC engineer is going to design the, the process to make that happen. So cooling is moving, heat, heating is going right, cooling left, dehumidification is going down, and humidification is going up. I think if you just know that, you'll be in pretty good shape with the psychometric stuff. Um, and then combustion, 
The last part that's covered is being able to balance a combustion reaction, calculate air fuel ratio. This is a, something we do in thermo. And uh, it's a review here, so you go back to your notes and see how we do that. Um, we react, we burn fuel, usually burn it in air, sometimes in pure oxygen, but usually in air, which is 3.76 parts nitrogen to one part oxygen on a molar basis. And uh, the reaction, when it's complete, yields CO2, H2O, and the nitrogen doesn't react, it just goes along for the ride and comes out the other side. Okay, and uh, so you might have to balance a reaction equation given a fuel. And uh, we do a conservation of, of mass across uh, the, from the reactants to the products. Uh, so you take each one and balance the number of atoms. We've got eight carbon atoms on the left, so we've got to have eight on the right. That means this B is going to be eight. It's the only place where we have carbon. Similar with hydrogen, hydrogen is only in the fuel. We've got 18 hydrogens. The only place hydrogen comes out is in the water. This is going to have to be a nine. Nine times two is 18, equals 18 over there. So you make sure you balance each each element to get the coefficients, and then you have a balanced reaction equation like that. And then you can uh, you can calculate the air fuel ratio. If it's stoichiometric air, this is just the mass of air per unit mass of fuel. Mass is moles times molar mass, and 29 for air. We can look these up in the table given in the, in the reference handbook and calculate our air fuel ratio, 15.14. Okay, so that's for stoichiometric. In this problem, we have 200% theoretical, which means we've got, we're going to multiply by three. Okay, so we have this formula, percent theoretical air is the actual air fuel ratio over stoichiometric times 100, and it's 200% in this case. So we can solve this for the actual air fuel ratio of 30.28. And that's closest to the 30. And I'm sorry I went over. <laughs> that's probably the longest review of, of any single subject because there's just so much there. But I hope that was helpful and you got back some memory, <laughs> remembered some things. <laughs> Did I leave anything out? <laughs> All right, well, let's take a break. In the remaining time, I have some problems for you to just work on. Um, and uh, I would like for you to turn in your work um, for credit to, for today. Um, just do as many as you can. Those two we get from the table 
but it's that weird table that looks a lot different from the ones we use in Thermo. So kind of getting used to navigating through that might take a bit. But a good, uh, I actually I can't, this might be in the, in the reference, I, I don't think it is, but I always just have in my brain, because I, I don't like to solve, have to solve this on the fly for x, but, but I, I just keep in my brain that x is going to be the property minus bf over bg minus bf. So if you, so, if you solve this for x, this is what you get. And, uh, and so that's how we calculate the quality. So you just plug in, this is B, big B over M minus BF over BG minus BF. And if, it, if you're looking at, uh, if you're using enthalpy, it's a little easier because usually tables will give you the FG. You can look that up and, and it saves you a little calculation. Or U minus UF over UFG, right? Is it, is it coming back? Is it coming back? Yeah. It's like, no, I, I'm trying to forget for a moment. All right, well, I'll solutions. Go ahead and keep working on it. Please give me your uh, answer. Thank <laughs> you.